want to speak with you about one of the parables that we find in the New Testament of the Bible. I suppose you could call it a parable about everyone wants to be first. Uh, it's a parable that teaches us about the danger of drawing um, improper comparisons. You know, I remember a man walking into a church meeting where, where I was attending in Toronto, and, uh, you know, he didn't. He, he, didn't, he wasn't particularly well dressed and I asked him if he would like to come in and sit down and everything and he said oh he says can you help me and that wasn't the first time that might have been the first time I saw him but it wouldn't be the last because on several subsequent occasions when he would come in almost week by week he would make a beeline for me and say can you help me his name was Doug and in my mind his name was Doug can you help me because those were the first words that came from his lips almost every time. And he had that sort of kind of strange look on his face, and his clothing wasn't particularly uh, well kept. And there was a lot about him that, that didn't make him an unattractive kind of individual. So, of course, we gave him some help each week, tried to help him, took him occasionally to places that he needed to go, and got things for him that he needed. After a while, I learned a little bit more about him. Now let me tell you what, what really happened. He, he said each time he came he would have a guitar strapped to his back and he'd want to play. And he wasn't particularly good at playing, but he played things. And because he was inside a church hall, he'd say, I know some things, I can play. And he'd strum along with some of the children's choruses kind of thing. And one time when he came and I was getting a bit frustrated and I thought, I've got to talk to this man and try and get him on the straight and narrow. And, and I said to him, Doug said, you know, you come to this church meeting every week and, and you come straight to me and ask me for help, but have you thought about what we're trying to talk about here? We're talking about Jesus Christ and we're talking about him being the saviour of the world, the saviour of people, like, just like me and just like you. And Doug looked at me and he says, oh, he says, I know that. <laughs> he said, a long time ago, he said, when, when I was younger, I went to a church and the, per the person that was looking after things there he saw me and he came to me and he said, what can I do to help you? And he said, well, I don't really know. He said, well, do you play anything? And I said, no. And so he said, well, would you like to learn how to play the guitar? And so I said, yes, Doug told me. And, and so the man at the church showed him how to play the guitar, took the time, and then showed him how to play children's choruses on the guitar and taught him the words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And years after on that day when I was talking to Doug, he started telling me about that background. And he says, I know, I know who Jesus is. I know that he died to save me. <laughs> He's got everything right. And subsequently I learned that all of his problems, which were many, had started when he was born. It was a difficult birth, and unfortunately, in the process of getting him into this world, damage was done to his brain so that he could never recover from that fully. And he had struggled along. His mother had been left a widow, and she wasn't able very well to look after him, and the social services had, have to, had to come in and, and try to do what they could. And so week by week, Doug had come to us for help. And my first... My first thoughts, I have to admit to you, my first thoughts are, well, you know, this man doesn't fit here. And it was me that wasn't fitting properly. And he was in exactly the right place. And all my thinking that I knew everything that needed to be known. And in his own simple way, he grasped it all. Oh, we learn, don't we, that if we make improper comparisons, we can come out with some really negative and wrong results. Now Jesus must have put up with that day by day by day. He attracted to himself, called people to follow him, and he, he had 12 special followers whom he called apostles. And, and they, they had to leave behind the, the, the kind of lifestyle that they'd enjoyed before, and they came along and followed him. I want to read to you from the New Testament of the Bible, from the first book of the New Testament of the Bible, the Gospel by Matthew, something about what Jesus said and the circumstance that arose, how it was misinterpreted by those disciples 
and therefore he had to use a parable to explain things to him. Let me read with you from Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honour your father and mother. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter in reply said, See, we have left everything and have followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who's left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. This is the parable that I mentioned that Jesus spoke to illustrate the points he was making. So the master of a house went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard and going out about the third hour, that would be about nine o'clock in the morning, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went along, going out again about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, that's about five o'clock in the afternoon, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the labourers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. That's equivalent to a day's pay. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Interesting, isn't it? The rich young ruler who comes to Jesus, and Jesus makes the invite to him to follow him, but it requires him to give up some of the things he already has. And though he's rich, he, he doesn't want to do what Jesus has told him to do. Jesus carefully recites the commands, the t out of the Ten Commandments, cites those that have to do with his responsibility towards his fellow man. And he says, yes, I've done all those. He might have thought, well, 
Why didn't Jesus pick the other commandments, the ones that have to do with my relationship with my God? And when he had said to Jesus, what more do I like? I wonder if Jesus could have said to him, well, you think that you're living right, but have you got your relationship with God right? He could have said that, couldn't he? But he just said to him, go and sell all of those things that you have and give to the poor because they need it more than you do. And you come and follow me. But the man went away with a regret written all over his face because he had so much that he was not prepared to give up. So Jesus explains that to the disciples and says it's very, very difficult for a person with wealth to give it up, to give it up for the sake of following Jesus. And you see what's involved in being part of the kingdom of God. It's following Jesus and taking the lowly place that that demands. He's the king of the kingdom. We can at best be his subjects and his servants and probably unprofitable ones at that. And so he explains to his disciples, it's difficult for a rich man to enter heaven. And he even says it's, it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. Some people think that that is a description of a camel having to stoop to go into a low gate in the wall of the city that was called the eye of the needle. But I think it's just an obvious meaning that, you know, a camel doesn't go through something as small as the eye of a needle, does it? And he was saying it's impossible to, for a man to accomplish that. But it's not impossible for God to do things. Everything's possible for God that's consistent with his character. And so he says if the, 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 the rich, therefore, it's going to be difficult for them to enter the kingdom. And Peter says, well, if the rich can't enter the kingdom, then what about us? What we, we've left everything. Where are we going to stand? If, if the rich don't get in and we've given up everything... We're at the bottom of the heap. What's going to be there for us? And you see how Peter is comparing himself to the rich person. And he's making assumptions about the level of difficulty for him to follow the Lord Jesus with the, the difficulty faced by the man who had the wealth. And maybe he thought that he had made great personal sacrifice and that he deserved more than a, a rich man who had walked away in the opposite direction. And he was wondering what Jesus would say. And Jesus says that there's going to be a reversal of our expectations. And when we make these comparisons, we'd better watch out because we might have it the wrong way around. The first are going to be last. The last are going to be first. For the many, that's going to be true. And then he gives this parable to explain it about the householder that had a vineyard. And it was a vineyard that needed much work doing to it. I don't know what the season of the year was, whether it was time for gathering the grapes or whether it was other work earlier on in the season that demanded lots of hard work. Work all the way through a day. And people called from the marketplace, day labourers, you know, in a, in a household in those times. If you were, if you were the owner of the householder, you, you were in, in a position of, of strength and control. If you were a servant in the household, you might think that's, that's a relatively humble position, but it's still much better because you've got security and a roof over your head, much better than being a day labourer who's got to look out for work from somebody who might hire them and just to do that on an everyday basis. And so that's the description of things. And, uh, and the, the man goes into the marketplace and picks up workers early in the morning. Some were there at six o'clock in the morning when he first went out. And he tells them to work into, in, in the vineyard and off they go. And they're going to get a day's pay for a day's work. And then we've got the expression that the Lord Jesus puts on it about going out at the third hour and so on, the sixth hour and the ninth hour and the eleventh hour and picking up people at different times of the day because the work still needed to be done. And then we get pay time at the end of the day. And Jesus, in his parable, teaches about the householder giving them all the same amount. Well, the ones that came late and only worked for an hour but got a day's pay, they would probably be very grateful, wouldn't they? But what about the ones that started off early in the morning and had worked all through the heat of the day, the scorching heat, it says, well, they were quite displeased. They were comparing themselves to the master and thinking that if the decision was theirs, they would have paid those people a lot, lot less. But it was the master who had decided, the householder who had decided to give the same to all. You know, we can compare ourselves with other people and our comparisons may be very, very inaccurate. God knows that we deserve to be punished for the things that we do wrong. And you know, if you're a parent, that sometimes... 
your family members will do things that displease you, but you don't always punish them because you love them. But in some cases, they turn against you so badly that you'd have no choice but to be disciplinary in your nature. Well, God's like that. He has to be just, he has to be fair, and he has to be absolutely right in his assessments that he makes of people. And because he knows everything about us, he can be. And his assessment is that we deserve to die forever and forever for all the bad things that we represent and are. And there's no way that we can change that. It's impossible for us. It would be more possible for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for us to change that picture. And we can't do it. But what's impossible for you and me is possible for God. It was still worthwhile God, the Son, Jesus, calling to the rich man in his wealth and saying to him, give it all up and come and follow me. And then using his example as an example of the kingdom of God. And the way that you get into it is by the mercy of God. God doing the impossible in his mercy and freeing you for service in his kingdom. Peter got it all wrong, didn't he? He thought he deserved a special reward. I've made all these sacrifices. What, what is going to be mine? And Jesus says, well, I'm going to have a throne and I'm going to be sitting and, and reigning on it. And you're going to have thrones and you're going to be doing the assessment of those around you, even of the privileged people of earth, the 12 tribes of Israel. Oh, what an amazing future was held out to Peter. But he was probably more preoccupied with the present at that time. Look what I've given up for you, my fishing business and all the things, the natural things that I would have enjoyed tomorrow. And so Jesus takes him a day at a time and he gives him the parable of the householder going to the marketplace day by day by day and picking up laborers. And of course it displeased some people because their comparisons were inaccurate. They thought that they should get more because they had worked longer. But there was one reward equal for all. You know, in another place you get a couple of other parables. One is a parable about what's called talents, which is an amount of money. Another is a parable about pounds, a different amount of money. And the parable about the talents, different people are described who got different amounts to invest and trade with and to see if they could profit from their activity. In the pounds, each got the same amount to start with. One of the ways that's been explained to me, and I pass it on to you today, is that when you're talking about something that's the same for all, it's probably talking about the way God deals with us as sinners, needing salvation. And salvation for you is the same as salvation for me. I can't get it any more easily than you can. And you can have it as easily as I have, had, have received it. We receive it from a merciful God. A God who knows me inside out. Knows all my weaknesses and flaws. Knows my imperfections. Knows how just it would be to punish me for the things that I have done and the things that I am. But he saved me by sending his own son from heaven because he loved me and allowing Jesus to take the punishment in my place as a substitute for me. And therefore I go free and I'm free to serve. So it's not just a matter of looking forward to what reward I'm going to get in heaven. It's to realize that right now, <laughs> on a daily basis, I've got the gift of salvation and I've got it in full. And nobody can come up and say, well, he only deserves a little bit of salvation, and I deserve a lot of salvation. Salvation is a commodity that you've either got it or you've not got it. It can't be divided. In the, the parable of the talents, where varying amounts are given, that may describe the different abilities that we have and uh, the degree to which we use them for God. But in the parable of the pounds, everyone gets the same. And it's the same here in this parable, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 20, about the householder and his, his day workers, they all get the same. We might say, that's unfair. But then Jesus says, is it really unfair? Am I, to, am I not entitled to, to give to who, wh whoever I wish, whatever I wish? Isn't it mine to give? And if I'm generous, should I be thought less of being overly generous? It's not that he deprived any of the workers of what was their due, but rather that he gave the same to all. And it seemed like excessive generosity, didn't it? But he knew what he was going to do. He had chosen to do it. You know, if ever the Lord Jesus looked at me and my life 
Would I expect him to choose to save me? Not at all. But he has, and he'll do the same for you. Will you not accept the position that he is prepared to offer you as a labourer for him? It starts out with you receiving the reward that you get in his disproportionate generosity. Others might question it. They might say, why, why do you say, use him as a Christian or her? But it's God that makes the choice, not you or me. The disciples themselves, they thought that they were special because they were disciples of Jesus. And he says to them, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Isn't that lovely? That God from the throne of heaven, knowing how the kingdom is supposed to operate, in all its fairness and righteousness, and in all its love and mercy, should be expressed on the earth. And it was all made possible by God the Son, Jesus Christ, becoming man and taking our place on the cross so that he might be able to give to us free, unmerited salvation through the grace of God. I commend these things to you for your further thought. Thank you very much for listening.